I'm most concerned about with this debate tonight. Uh, the, the idea that people should, uh, should be willing to sacrifice their lives, their, their friends' lives, their families' lives, uh, their entire population, uh, because of some belief uh, for which there is no objective or not reasonable way to, uh, to make an argument in favor. That is a very dangerous thing. It has happened all over the place. It is happening today all over the place. Look at the religious wars or religions-inspired wars that are occurring all the time, including right at this moment in which we're talking, there are, there are people that are being killed in this world because of their beliefs. And uh, that is a, something that is really scary. And it's something that maybe if we start thinking about these things a little more rationally, we might avoid or at least diminish in frequency and occurrence. Thanks. We'll have a five-minute final statement from each debater. In my closing speech, I'd like to draw together the threads of the debate and give some assessment of the arguments. First, have we seen any reasons tonight to falsify the God hypothesis? I think the answer is clearly no. Dr. P. Liucci simply says that we reject things due to the absence of evidence. Not always, only sometime. For example, if we were to say, uh, is there an elephant in this room? The absence of any evidence would be a good reason to think there is no elephant in this room. But if someone were to assert there is no flea in this room, would the absence of evidence for the flea be a good reason to think there's not a flea in the room? Well, clearly not. The point is that absence of evidence is evidence of absence only in the case where if the thing did exist, you would expect to have some more evidence of it than what you do. And in the case of God, Dr. Piliucci simply hasn't shown us that if God did exist, that we would expect to have more evidence than such as I've laid out tonight. He says, well, what about other things like leprechauns? They violate the laws of physics and biology. Exactly. That's my point. You have positive reasons to not believe that those things exist. But in the case of God, this doesn't violate the laws of physics and biology. We've had no good reason tonight to think that the God hypothesis is false. On the contrary, any evidence that's been given tonight has been on the side of verifying this hypothesis. First, I argued that God best explains the origin of the universe. And all Dr. Piliucci could do in his last speech was appeal to the quantum vacuum as being close to nothing. Let me quote from Bernhard Kanitscheider, a German philosopher of science, on this. Vacuum fluctuation models, he says, are far from being a spontaneous generation of everything from naught. The origin of that embryonic bubble is really a causal process leading from a primordial substratum with a rich physical structure to a materialized substratum of the vacuum. This process includes that weak kind of causal dependence peculiar to every quantum mechanical process. So it is simply false that quantum mechanics gives us any uh, idea of the origin of something out of nothing, and yet that's what the atheist has to say about the Big Bang if he denies that God exists. With regard to the fine-tuning of the universe, uh, he hasn't come back on that point. It's preposterous to think that this finely-tuned universe just popped into being out of nothing, replete with these conditions requisite for the existence and evolution of intelligent life. Third, objective moral values. He says adaptations are enough. Well, now, they might be enough to govern a society, but that's not my argument. My argument is that these objective values do exist, that we do apprehend them, and therefore it follows logically and inescapably that God exists. My argument is not an argument that you need God to have a working society. He says, well, if the good is independent of God, then we don't need God. No, what I said is that God's nature is good. God is good by nature. The good is the character of God himself. God is by nature loving, holy, fair, just, and so forth. And this expresses itself to us in the form of commandments, which become our moral duties. So there's no dilemma here. God's nature is the good. But notice on his view, we are lost in sociocultural relativism without any grounding for moral values. What about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? He couldn't deny the facts of Jesus' radical personal claims or the empty tomb or the appearances of Jesus. All he could do is repeat that people believe weird and novel things. 
But again, the point is that within Judaism, the disciples confronted with the, res with the crucifixion of Jesus would probably at most have preserved their master's tomb as a shrine, where his bones would reside until the resurrection at the end of the world. They wouldn't have come up with this absurd and un-Jewish idea that he was already risen from the dead. So any historian who is responsible studying the historical Jesus has to give some explanation of the origin of that belief, and Dr. Piliucci hasn't been able to do that tonight. Finally, the immediate experience of God. He says there's a simpler explanation, namely that there is no God. But look, it's a simpler explanation to say there is no external world either. The external world is fantastically complex. Why posit it? Well, simply because we trust our experiences in the absence of a defeater. And we haven't heard any defeaters tonight for why I should deny or distrust my experience of God. In conclusion, I want to say simply that I myself wasn't raised in a Christian family or a church-going uh, family, but I, as a teenager, began to ask the questions about the meaning of life. I began to read the New Testament, and as I did so, I found an experience of God there that changed my life. And I want to invite you to simply do the same thing. When you go home tonight and you're lying in bed, before you go to sleep, ask yourself, could there be a God who exists, who loves me? and has revealed himself in Christ, and begin to read the New Testament as I did, it could change your life in the same way that it did mine. Thank you. Okay, a few final words. It seems to me that Dr. Craig tried five arguments tonight, and I won't repeat them because we went both over them several times. The conclusion seems, uh, the following conclusions seem reasonable to me. Three of these arguments do not apply to the existence of the Christian God, so he's missed the point entirely over there, and they're essentially irrelevant to our discussion tonight. If now we wanted the last minute to, to, uh, to broaden this, this discussion to a more generalized kind of God, I'd be happy to do that. I've answered some of those arguments, but this was not what we were studying tonight. Those three arguments are no reason whatsoever to believe in the Christian God in particular. Uh, one argument, his last argument, is not even an argument by his own admission, so we can discard that one as well. So essentially, he's left here to talk to you for almost an hour, telling you to believe in miracles. That's, that's his only argument. And I think that that's a pretty weak argument, especially because a lot of other religions can claim miracles. And they are equally convinced, as any Christian is, that their miracles are true, are correct, are empirically verifiable, historically verifiable, and so on and so forth. So who is right? Are you sure you picked the right one? Uh, miracles, the argument about miracles has been debunked very thoroughly, much better than I could ever do, uh, by David Hume back in the 18th century, and it's pretty surprising to me that people like Dr. Craig still use that kind of argument as their uh, main, main defense of, of theism. Um, I think the better thing you could do is simply to go out there and read Hume by yourself. It's not that difficult, and in fact, it's actually pretty entertaining. Now, he says, how about unicorns violate the laws of biology? So that's positive evidence that they don't exist. Well, by the same reason, you want to know a list of the laws of physics and biology that are violated by any religious claim to miracles? It's a long list. So by that argument, then, we have a perfectly good reasons to reject that kind of belief. Um, notice that we keep throwing at each other this quantum mechanical stuff, and I hope you guys are really confused about it because that's the way it should be. Um, quantum mechanics is very confusing. But notice that he quoted, quoted a philosopher of science on quantum mechanics, not a physicist. Now, I'm, as, I said, as the moderator said in the beginning of this debate, I am pursuing a degree in philosophy, so I have the utmost respect for philosophers. I don't want to insult any philosopher present in, in here. On the other hand, I also know, and I have read several papers by philosophers of biology, and I can tell you that I can find plenty of mistakes and misunderstandings of biology in those writings, so I wouldn't really put particular faith in what a philosopher of, of science says about quantum mechanics. Again, remember Feynman's saying that not even physicists really understand what they're talking about when it comes to quantum mechanics. Objective values do exist. Local objective truths do exist. And they exist for a very good reason, because they evolved in order to permit certain social animals to have a social structure and to have and to, and to proliferate. It seems to me that this 
pretty good argument and it's a pretty good explanation of why we have objective moral truths and also why we have this intuitive understanding that there are moral truths out there. Incidentally, Dr. Craig is one of the few philosophers left that doesn't take this position. A lot of moral, moral ethicists today actually accept this kind of view that moral beliefs and um, moral, moral rules actually evolved and are adaptive and of course they do change over a certain period of time and to some extent given certain circumstances but that's just life. Uh, therefore I am in no way em uh, embracing any social cultural relativism whatsoever. I'm just not a social cultural relativist and I'm sick and tired of people accusing me of just because I don't believe in a, in a, in a universal set of uh, beliefs that then therefore anything goes. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, anything goes only in the, in the song by Cole Porter and that's about it. Um, about the historicity, you know, we've been talking about uh, the historicity of certain claims. You know, historians and historical sources are really funny things. You should, it, it, fa history is fascinating. Uh, I'm sure most of you have had my same experience of a pretty boring subject matter in, in school. But in fact, it's a fascinating subject matter. There are all sorts of bizarre things that historical sources claim. For example, many of the historians, of the Roman historians at the time, uh, that were alive before and after, and after Jesus make all sorts of interesting claims, such as that several emperors were taken to heaven in golden chariots. Now, why are we not to believe that kind of, uh, of statement? It comes from a similar kind of source that, uh, to those that Dr. Craig has actually pointed out tonight. Now, let me finish with a positive point. I think that tonight, uh, when you go home, instead of, of uh, doing whatever Dr. Craig suggested you should do, you should go to sleep. You deserved it. It's, it's been a long evening. We still have questions and answers to come, and it's going to be very interesting. You've got plenty to think about. On the other hand, what you should do tomorrow morning or the day after or the day after is to go to the library. Go to your public library or go to your university library and start read. And never stop. Read and think about these things until your last day. You probably will come up with a better understanding of what we're talking about here, probably better than our own here tonight. Thank you. I notice that a lot of people are sort of fanning. It's kind of warm in here. I suggest that I'm going to do it. Uh, you might want to re remove a, a coat, nothing more, <laughs> uh, to be uh, somewhat comfortable. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to start the questions in a few minutes, and I wanted to sort of go back over that. Let me make one remark as the moderator. Uh, I think you've heard uh, a presentation uh, on the left uh, of what could be called classical supernatural theism. Uh, on the right, uh, I think you could claim that you have heard a presentation of classical uh, non-theistic naturalism. And by a simple logical principle, uh, both of these positions can't be true but both might be false. And there may be a third alternative. And I've got it. <laughs> Should we start worshiping you now or? The third alternative is non supernaturalistic theistic naturalism. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's a position. Uh, now, at any rate, in terms of the questions, folks, if you're a member, uh, anyone who wants to raise a question uh, of Professor Craig, uh, come over here, and we want to uh, go through this rather carefully. Uh, anyone who has a question of Professor Pilucci comes over here and addresses a question to the microphone. Uh, remember, the rules on this would be 30 seconds per question, no more. And I will be sort of watching that rather carefully, hopefully. Uh, and uh, then there will be uh, a uh, response to the question uh, of the person to whom the question is asked. And then uh, the opposite side will give a one-minute response to uh, either the question or the response to the question. So uh, I got confused. Okay, go ahead. You, you, you got it. You got it? Yeah. Uh, okay.